Hi, I'm Courtney Otani, a Clean Energy Institute graduate fellow from the Mechanical Engineering Department, Novo Solov Research Group, and I'll be teaching you about the unknown state of matter that I deal with every day in my research, supercritical fluids. First off, let's review what matter is. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. To keep it simple, you can think of mass as weight. So altogether, matter is pretty much everything we are and interact with every day. A cup is matter, the water you pour into it is matter, the air you breathe is matter, you and I also matter. And all of this matter is made up of atoms. They are the building blocks of matter, and they're small. For example, the average thickness of a strand of hair is 300,000 atoms thick. And these atoms are made up of even smaller particles. Electrons are negatively electrically charged particles that zoom around the nucleus, which is a tight ball of neutrally electrically charged particles called neutrons and positively electrically charged particles called protons. Depending on how many protons are in the nucleus, the kind of atom or element it is changes. This is how oxygen differs from hydrogen. And a combination of those elements makes compounds. For example, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom make the compound water. These atoms and compounds can look and act in different ways. The different ways matter looks and acts are called states or phases of matter. For the rest of this video, I'll switch back and forth between the words state and phase, but know that I'm talking about the same thing. The difference between these different states is energy. Energy is the ability for something to do work. For example, a big wave of water from the ocean has a lot of energy and ability to take a surfer into shore, move sand, and wash out someone's beach at picnic. But a lake of still water does not have a lot of energy and will only make the plants in its way softly. The kind of energy I described is mechanical energy because the water had or didn't have the ability to move things. There are other types or forms of energy, but I'll explain that when we get to it. For now, let's look at the different phases of matter. The three most familiar ones are solid, liquid, and gas. In the solid phase, compounds have strong bonds or connections with each other that make them in a range in a specific pattern. An example of this is ice. When you add more energy to the solid ice, it transforms into liquid water. The compounds now have weaker bonds between each other and slide past each other freely while still staying close to one another. If you add more energy to the liquid water, it becomes gaseous steam. The compounds now are no longer bonded to each other, but freely zoom around in space. Plasma is the fourth state of matter that might be familiar to some. If you add a ton more energy to the gas, it becomes a plasma. The electrons are ripped away from the atoms and the positively charged nucleus and electrons zoom freely around in space. An example of plasma is the matter inside of fluorescent light bulbs and neon signs. In nature, plasma is what makes up lightning and stars such as the sun. In between of the gas and plasma phase, there's the supercritical phase. In comparison to the other phases, it shares some characteristics of the gas and liquid phase. It moves around like a gas, but it is more tightly packed and can dissolve things well like a liquid. When I say dissolve, picture when you mix sugar with water and the water becomes clear again. The sugar dissolved in the liquid water. In nature, supercritical fluids make up the atmosphere of Jupiter and Saturn, like how air makes up Earth's atmosphere. So we learned that plasma has more energy than supercritical phase, and gas has less. But when exactly does gas become a supercritical fluid, and what must happen for it to eventually reach a plasma state? How much energy does it need to make those changes in states? Well, two things can tell you how much energy something has. It's temperature and pressure. Temperature lets you know how much heat or thermal energy something has. Steaming soup has high temperature and lots of thermal energy. Ice cream has a low temperature and just a little thermal energy. Pressure lets you know how much mechanical energy there is. A shaken soda can has a lot of pressure, and you can already imagine how fast and far the soda would spray if you opened it. That's the energy it has. And once you've opened it, it doesn't have any pressure anymore. It has no more mechanical energy. So after many experiments where scientists took notes of when changes of state and matter happened at a lot of different temperatures and pressures, phase diagrams were created. Now this lets us pinpoint what phase or state something will be in, depending on its temperature and pressure. This plot is unique for every kind of material, but the one shown here is for a random one, because most materials act the same way and will have a similar looking phase diagram. 
As you can see, at low temperatures and pressures are where solids exist. At temperatures a little higher than that are where liquids exist. If you raise the temperature again, this is where gases exist. When conditions reach or pass a certain temperature and pressure called the critical temperature and critical pressure, which together make the critical point, matter is in the supercritical fluid phase. And at super high temperatures are where plasmas exist. The supercritical phase boundary is marked by dotted lines because when things are in the supercritical phase of matter, the separation between the liquid and gas phase disappears. So near the limits of the critical pressure and critical temperature, the exact state of matter can be unclear because the separation between the phases gets harder to define. So why should we be interested in supercritical fluids? They're important because they have the superpower of having a wide range of properties within a small range of temperatures and pressures close to the critical point, which allow it to do a lot of different things. It's used to create beauty products, medicine, clothing, materials, chemicals, energy, and clean water. One of the most relatable things supercritical fluids is used for is taking the caffeine out of coffee to make decaf coffee. This works by flowing supercritical fluids over unroasted coffee beans, which pulls the caffeine out and leaves all the other compounds that make the coffee taste like coffee. It's able to specifically pick the caffeine and leave the flavor because the machine runs at a specific temperature and pressure, so the supercritical fluid has just the right properties to pick it out. If you choose a different set of temperatures and pressures, the same supercritical fluid can be used to pull out whatever you want from a different substance. For example, pulling healing compounds out of plants to make medicine. Really, the possibilities for supercritical fluids are endless. I hope that you had fun learning about supercritical fluids today with me, and I'm glad to have shared a little of my research world with you. Thank you for watching.